Chemistry, how are we doing today? Hopefully y'all are doing well. So today we're gonna to be continuing our notes on unit four, all right? And for this, we're gonna be covering redox reactions. Now for this, please make sure you've got everything that you need for your notes. So notes, pencil, you know, periodic table if you need that. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and dive on into these notes. All right, so what is a redox reaction? Well, redox is just an abbreviation for oxidation and reduction. So it has to do with those things. So what is a redox reaction? What is a reduction oxidation reaction? Well, these are gonna be reactions that involve a transfer or a movement of one or more electrons to another place, okay? So we're gonna be transferring electrons from one place to another. And this is gonna happen in all your single replacement reactions, all your combustion reactions, and then the majority of your synthesis and decomposition reactions as well. Now, one thing I'll say is that redox reactions are not quite as simple as like a traditional balancing your equations where you just look at your elements and you say, okay, I've got this many on the left and this many on the right. There's a little more to that. So we're gonna get into that and let's actually see what's going on in a redox reaction. Okay, so for a redox reaction, you need to know electronegativity. Specifically, what is electronegativity? And electronegativity, remember, is that attraction for shared electrons. So we're gonna be looking at those electrons and we're trying to get them to attract to one side over the other. That's what electronegativity is. And you do need to keep in mind these four elements. These are the most electronegative elements on your periodic table. Those elements are fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine. And you do need to know them in that order because that's from greatest to least in terms of electronegativity. Now, I've always remembered this as just saying phone call, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, phon, and then CL would represent that call um, because that just kind of helps you remember that, um, that order that they go in from highest to lowest in terms of the top four electronegative, electronegative elements, okay? Now, the reason you need to know these is because these four elements are going to be the most likely to have a negative oxidation number. So when we're looking at these and we're trying to figure out, well, which one of these is going to be negative, you're going to be looking at which has the highest electronegativity, basically. And so these four kind of help you kind of put a, uh, just a reminder of, hey, I need to keep these in mind because they are going to be the highest electronegativity. Okay. Now, for this, we do need to know oxidation state. This is a big thing in redox reactions. It's kind of the most important thing in redox reactions because it's where you start with it all. So what is an oxidation state? A common misconception is the oxidation state is charge. Sometimes they're the same, but not always. Oxidation state is really looking at those electrons and seeing what's truly going on inside of it. It's not necessarily a full move of electrons. Sometimes you'll have some sharing of electrons and that kind of thing, but it's which direction those electrons are more likely to be transferred to over the other, okay? Now for this, you do need to recognize that there are some rules for oxidation state. So let's kind of dive on into those and let's see what we've got. So the first one here says the oxidation state of an atom in an element equals zero. So what does that mean? So the oxidation state of an atomant in an element equals zero. Well, what it means is if we're talking about just an atomant or a diatomic element or something like that, its oxidation state is always zero. And by that mean, I'm saying like if I take pure sodium and I mix it with something else, that pure sodium is just that element. And as a result, its oxidation state is zero. Why would it be zero? Well, remember, with redox reactions, we're talking about a transfer of electrons, right? Well, if we're talking about the atom, nothing is left. There's been no transfer of electrons yet. It's just that atom, okay? Rule number two says the oxidation states of a monatomic element equals its charge. And by that, what I mean is if I'm looking at something like the lithium ion, the lithium ion is going to have a positive one charge, right? Well, that would mean its oxidation state is a positive one as well. So anytime we're looking at just the element, its oxidation state is equal to its charge, okay? Rule number three, oxygen. Oxygen is in the lot of the redox reactions. And so oxygen is nice to know because oxygen is pretty much always a negative two. So if I'm comparing... Um, 
oxygen in carbon dioxide, um, what I'm going to see is that that oxygen um, is going to have a negative two oxidation state. Okay. Um, now this is going to be when we're talking about a covalent compound, because with ionic, we know that they're going to equal their charge, right? Now, the exception to this would be when oxygen is in a peroxide. And by peroxide, I mean you've got an oxygen bonded directly to another oxygen. There's going to be that um, in a covalent bond. That's going to form what we call a peroxide. And in that case, your oxygen actually has a negative one instead of a negative two oxidation state. Rule number four, hydrogen has a plus one oxidation state when it's in a covalent compound. Rule number five, fluorine is a negative one in compounds in general. So anytime fluorine forms a compound, um, it's going to have a negative one um, oxidation state. And then the last rule says that the sum of your oxidation states should equal zero if we're talking about a compound, or it should equal the charge if we're talking about an ion. So if I'm talking about something like carbon dioxide, the sum of their oxidation numbers equals zero. Why? Because carbon dioxide does not have a charge. But if I'm talking about something like sulfate, sulfate has a negative two charge, and so the sum of your oxidation numbers would equal that negative two. Okay? So let's go ahead and dive on into some of this work here. So here we're asked essentially to find the oxidation numbers for each of these elements. So we're going to start with N2O. Now, looking at this, I know that N is going to have a high electronegativity, but I also know that oxygen is pretty much always a negative two, right? So since I see oxygen, I should immediately be able to write my oxidation state for oxygen as a negative two there. All right, so I've got my oxygen has a negative two, and I know that there's only one oxygen there. And so since there's only one oxygen, that means my total oxidation state is going to be negative two. Okay, so my total oxidation state is my oxidation state times the number of that element I have. Okay, so that's going to equal something. Well, what do we want this overall to equal? Well, we know that the sum of our oxidation states should equal zero if we're talking about just a regular compound. This is a regular compound. There is no charge. So since there's no charge, since this is not an ion, the sum of my oxidation numbers should equal zero. Okay, so now I know the sum should equal zero. I've got negative two currently, so I need a total of positive two coming from that nitrogen. I have two nitrogen and the sum should equal positive two when it's all said and done. Well, that means that each nitrogen must have a positive one as its oxidation state, okay? Because two times that positive one is gonna give me a positive two there. So looking at this, my nitrogen's oxygen state would be plus one, and the oxygen's oxi oxidation state would be minus two. Okay, so let's look at this next one. So this next one is a little bit different because with this next one, we don't actually have any of our rules that we necessarily know, right? Okay, so what do I start with here? Well, if I look at my electronegativities, I know that I've got my bromine, and bromine's got about a two electronegativity, you know, if you follow your general trend. And then I look at my phosphorus. Phosphorus has about a two as well. So you're like, okay, well, neither of them has a greater electronegativity, so which would it be? Well, we have to think about those electrons, the tendency to attract an electron. Remember, bromine is a halogen, and halogens only are missing one valence electron. So halogens are very likely to gain that one valence electron. So what that would tell me is that the oxidation state for this bromine is a negative one. So now I've got that. So I'll have three bromine. They've each got a negative one. So my total oxidation number is coming, coming from bromine is a negative three. I want that to overall equal a zero. Why? Because this is just a normal compound. It is not an ion. So to cancel out my negative three, I need a positive three. I've got one phosphorus. That one phosphorus has to give me a total of positive three when it's done. 
So then this phosphorus has a positive 3 for its oxidation number. Okay? Last one that we're going to do for practice that I'm going to walk along with y'all. So here I've got HPO3, negative 2. Now this one's got a couple different things that have changed. First, it's not just two elements, right? And so when it's not just two elements, we're going to have to look at all of them individually and see what our oxidation state will be. Second, this is not a normal compound. It is an ion. And as a result, the sum of their oxidation numbers should equal that charge. Okay, so let's dive into this. First off, I know hydrogen is a positive 1. I know oxygen is a negative 2. A lot of times I find it's easier if you just put the things that you know immediately down. Don't second guess it. Okay. After that, then we're going to start to try to figure out what our phosphorus has as its oxidation state. So I have 3 times negative 2 gives me a total of negative 6 coming from oxygen. I've also got a positive 1 coming from our hydrogen, right? Because there's one hydrogen, it's got a plus one oxidation state. I want my total to equal negative two. Now this is different because it is coming from that charge of that ion. So then I need to figure out, okay, I've got a positive one and a negative six, and I want this to equal negative two. So what does that mean I need? Well, what it means is I need a total of positive three. Okay, so I know my phosphorus needs to give me a positive 3. So I look and I see, okay, I've got one phosphorus. That one phosphorus needs to be giving me a plus 3. All right, so I'm going to leave these next two for y'all to practice. So pause your video real quick, go through, work it, then we'll go over it, and we will move on to the next section of the notes, all right? Okay, so hopefully you paused your video, but here would be the oxidation states for each of these elements. So first off, with my phosphorus and the oxygen over here, I have a positive 3 for phosphorus and a negative 2 for oxygen. And y'all, you will find that I'm going to kind of move along quickly as we go with our solving for our oxidation states, um, because I'm hoping at this point y'all kind of got it down on what we're doing here, how we're solving for this, okay? So our phosphorus is a positive 3, oxygen is a negative 2. Moving over here to that NH2 with a negative charge, I found that my nitrogen has a negative 3 and my hydrogen has a positive 1. Again, keep in mind the charge of your ion there. That charge should be what the sum of your oxidation states should be. All right. So now let's go ahead and move on. So next I've got oxidation and reduction. Well, that's what this entire lesson is about, right? Oxidation and reduction. So let's talk about what those mean. So oxidation is the term that we use for the loss of electrons. Now, if we lose electrons, our oxidation number is going to increase. Why would it do that? Well, remember that electrons are negative. So when you lose that negative, it becomes more positive, right? So the oxidation number is going to increase. Reduction is going to be the opposite. So we're going to be gaining electrons, and as a result, we are going to decrease our oxidation numbers. I always remember this by saying, okay, well, reduction, like if I say that the price at the store was reduced, I know that, that means that the price went down, right? And so that kind of helps me remember, okay, my oxidation number is also going to go down. All right? Now, for me, how I've always remembered this is I've always said oil rig. Oil rig is oxidation is losing, and we're talking about electrons. Reduction is gaining electrons. Okay, so oxidation is losing electrons. Reduction is gaining electrons. You could also say Leo the lion goes grr, right? And so Leo the lion goes grr, where the loss of electrons is oxidation, and the gain of electrons is reduction. Both work, whatever works for you, okay? The next thing is oxidizing agent and reducing agent. So our oxidizing agent is going to be the thing that is the electron acceptor. So it's the thing that's gaining the electron. This is going to be your substance that is reduced. Why? Because reduction is gaining electrons, right? So if it goes through reduction, it is the oxidizing agent. If it goes through oxidation, it is the reducing agent because that's going to be the electron donor. Now, one thing I'll say about this is that 
On the AP exam, they don't tend to test oxidizing and reducing agents. That is not going to be what you find on the AP exam, but it is a common chemical term. And so it is going to be something that would be helpful to know in the future, okay? So let's take a look at how we would actually use this. So this is determine whether each reaction shown below is a redox reaction. For each redox reaction, identify the element oxidized, the element reduced, oxidized agent, and reducing agent. So what do we do for this? Essentially, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go through and list all of our oxidation states. So I know that oxygen here has a negative two, I know that hydrogen has a positive one. I've got a positive two total com coming from hydrogen. I've got a negative eight total coming from our oxygen. So that means I need a total of positive six coming from carbon. So I need plus three for each of them. Okay, moving over here, sodium, oxygen, hydrogen. Oxygen is a negative two, hydrogen is a positive one. That means the nitrogen or the sodium, sorry, needs to be a positive one. Keep on moving. Sodium here, not quite sure. Carbon here, maybe not quite sure, but we do know oxygen is a negative two. Probably our sodium is gonna end up being a positive one. And then last we've got our carbon here, which is gonna end up being a negative three. Sorry, uh, positive three. Now, last thing, I've got my H2O. Oxygen has a negative two, hydrogen is a positive one. So what do I do with all of this? Well, I look and I see, okay, hydrogen right here went from positive one and we go to the other side and we see over here, it stayed positive one. So nothing happened, right? Carbon went from positive three to positive three. Again, nothing happened. Oxygen, negative two to negative two to negative two. So no changes on any of those options. Sodium went from positive one to positive one, no change there. Again, my oxygen here, oxygen went from negative two to negative two to negative two, no change. And then last, I've got my hydrogen there. Hydrogen went from positive one to positive one, so no change. So looking at that entire reaction, did anything change? No. So what that would tell me is that there is no change, which means this is not a redox reaction, okay? So sometimes that's what we're gonna see. We're gonna see that this reaction went to completion, but there was no true exchange or true, tr true transfer of electrons. So let's look at this next one. I have my CuSO4 plus Mg produced MgSO4 plus Cu. So looking at this, I know my oxygen is a minus two. Right here, I've got sulfate, right? So since I've got sulfate here, I know that the total oxidation state would be a negative two. I've got my sulfur here. Um, so when I'm solving for that, I'm gonna find that my sulfate or my sulfur is a positive six, which means my copper needs to be a positive two, okay? Moving on over, magnesium here. Magnesium is just the element. Remember we talked about just elements would have an oxidation state of zero. Coming over here, oxygen's always a minus two. In this case, our sulfur is again going to be a positive six. Again, we're talking about that sulfate ion. And then we've got our magnesium here, which is going to be a positive two. Got my copper. Copper is going to be zero because it's in its free state. And let's see how we changed. Copper went from positive two to zero, so it did change. Sulfur went from positive six to positive six. It did not change. Oxygen went from negative two to negative two. It did not change. And last, we've got magnesium. It went from zero to positive two. It did change. So what changed? Magnesium went from zero to positive two. Since it went up, we say that that is oxidized. And if it was oxidized, that would be our reducing 
agent. The other thing that changed is our copper. Copper went from positive two and it went down to zero. So it was reduced, which means it is our oxidizing agent. All right. So I'm actually going to leave the rest of these for y'all to practice. And I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next um, page. Um, but the key is going to be posted. So make sure to check that and double check your answers. All right. Moving on here, the next part of this redox reaction is going to be balancing using the half reaction method. Now, this is actually going to be the most common way that we'll see this um, because this is going to be where kind of we get into the nitty gritty of redox and we kind of look and see what's truly going on in that reaction. So let's go through these rules. So the first step is to write your skeleton half reaction. And so all that is, is it's looking and seeing, okay, I've got this part and it started as this as a reactant and it ended as this as a product. And so you're just going to write about that piece and you see what's actually going on. And again, we'll get to that in just a second. Next, we're going to balance out all elements other than oxygen and hydrogen. So we're going to make sure that if we've got sodium on one side, it's got the same amount of sodium on the other side. Okay. Next, we're going to balance out our oxygen by adding H2O. So we balance out the oxygen by adding H2O. So we're adding water to this reaction. Okay. And again, the oxygen is in that water, right? So let's look at next number four. So we're going to balance out our hydrogen by adding hydrogen ions. Okay. So for number five, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to balance the charge by adding electrons to the more positive side. So we're going to make sure that if we're looking at that single reaction, that single half reaction, we're going to try to add, we're going, well, we're not going to try, we're going to add more electrons to that more positive side. So if it's negative one on one side and it's negative four on the other side, negative one, negative four, we're going to add some more electrons to this more positive side, that negative one side. Okay. Rule number six says we're going to make the number of electrons lost equal the number of electrons gained by multiplying each half reaction by a factor. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to compare our half reactions and we're going to make sure those electrons are going to equal each other. Next, we're going to add those half reactions together. So we're going to take everything that we've made and we're going to put it all together in one big reaction. Then we're going to cancel out anything that is the same on both sides. So if you've got water on both sides, you're going to cancel them out. If you don't have an equal amount of water, you just cancel, about, cancel out the amount that is the same on both sides. So if, if on the left you've got 12 water and on the right you've got 8, you would cancel out the 8 and 8 from the 12 side and you'd be left with 4 on that 12 side. Okay. Next, what we're going to do is if the reaction occurs in a basic solution, okay, so you'll be, uh, when you're looking through these, you'll find that it says it's either acidic or basic. If it's occurring in a basic solution, we're going to have to add hydroxide ions to both sides, and we do that to cancel out our hydrogen ions. When we do that, we know we take a hydrogen and a hydroxide and we make some water. So what that's going to do is it's going to cancel out the extra hydrogen on one side, turn it into water, um, and then if necessary, so if you create some more water that would then be able to be canceled out, you would need to go back in and cancel that out as well. And the very last thing, the nice thing about redox is that you can go back in and check your charge and your mass to make sure that they are balanced. Okay, so you can add up the charges on the left, add up the charges on the right, and it should all equal the same number. You can add up the number of elements on the left and the number of elements on the right. And again, it should equal the same number. All right. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's put all of this into action. So here I've got 10 with a positive 2 plus Cr2O7 with a negative 2. And it's going to produce 10 with a positive 4 and chromium with a positive 3. Now it does say this is in an acidic solution, so we will not need to go back in and add that hydroxide at the end. So how do I do this? Well, first off, I need to set up my half reactions. So what I do is I look, okay, I've got 10. And it went from 10 with a positive 2 over here to 10 with a positive 4. So my half reaction is Sn with a plus 2. And it went to 
Sn with a plus 4. And that's it. That half reaction is set up. Now let's look at our next half reaction. I started with Cr2O7 with a negative 2, and it went to Cr with a positive 3. All right, so I've got my half reaction set up. So now what I need to do, what the next step says, is to balance out all the elements except for oxygen and hydrogen. So here, I've got 10 on the top, it's on the left, and on the right, there's only one for each of those, so we're gonna leave it as it is. On the Cr207 and the Cr plus three, we've got two chromium on the left, we've got one on the right, so we're gonna to need to put a two right there to balance out those chromiums. All right, that step is done. The next step is going to be add ox or add water to balance out your oxygen. So first off, looking at that reaction, half reaction A, I'm gonna label these for you to make it just a little bit easier to talk about. So looking at half reaction A, is there any oxygen? No, there's not. So we don't need to do anything to that one. Looking at half reaction B, is there any oxygen? Yes, there is. So we're gonna to have to add water to balance out that oxygen. So on the left side, I have seven oxygen. On the right side, I have zero. So I'm gonna to have to add seven more oxygen using water. So I'm gonna add seven more water, okay? Well, now that ba balances those oxygens out. The next thing is to balance out our hydrogen. Looking at reaction A, is there any hydrogen? No. At reaction B, is there any hydrogen? Well, there is now that I've added that water, right? And so since I added that water, I did end up at, uh, needing to add some hydrogen. I've got 14 hydrogen on the right, I've got uh, zero on the left, so I'm gonna need to add 14 hydrogen ions. Okay, now we look at our next step. So our next step says to balance the charge by adding electrons to a more positive side. Okay, so here's what we do for that. Right here at the top in reaction A, again, let me relabel re these. For reaction A here, half reaction A, I've got 10. It's got a total of plus two. And then on the right side, I've got a total of plus four. Okay, do those charges balance? Well, no, they don't. So what I need to do is I'm gonna need to add some more um, charge, some more electrons to the more positive side. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna add two electrons. Okay, added two electrons. So now I had four, but I've also got plus a negative two, which is gonna give me a total of positive two, right? So we're gonna cancel all that out. Okay, now our charges are the same on both sides there. So let's move down here and let's see what we've got. So on this one, I've got 14 hydrogens, which means I've got a plus 14 charge right there. And then I've got just one chromate here and it's got a negative two. So on the left side, I've got a total of 12. And then on the right side, I've got two times that positive three, so positive six, and that's it. So on the left, my total, um, my total charge is positive 12. And on the right side, my total charge is positive six. They do not balance out. So we're gonna to need to add some more electrons to that more positive side. In this case, the more positive side is going to be the left side. So we're gonna add six more electrons, okay? Now, I added those six electrons and now I've got six, negative six, plus 14 is gonna give me a total of positive eight, minus two more is gonna give me a total of positive six. So there we would see those charges are now balanced out. Now, the next step is to look at my two half reactions. So my reaction A and my reaction B and see, okay, I've got six electrons on reaction B. I've got two electrons on reaction A. So I'm going to need to multiply all of half reaction A by three. Why by three? Because three times two is gonna give me six. 
and then I'll have six electrons on the right and six electrons on the left. Okay, so I'm actually going to go ahead and rewrite that. So half reaction A is going to become three um, S N with a positive two, and that produces three S N with a positive four plus six electrons. Okay. So now I've done that. I've done my step six. So the next thing is to add all my half reactions together. So I'm going to add half reaction A and half reaction B. And what I'm going to get is 3SN with a positive 2 plus 6 electrons plus 14 hydrogen ions plus Cr2O7 with a negative 2. And that would be everything on the reactant side. Now we need to go to the product side. So 3SN with a plus 4 plus 6 electrons plus 2 chromium ions, positive 3, plus 7H2O. Okay, so there is everything written out. So now what I need to do is go back in and cancel out anything that is the same on both sides. So the same on both sides, looking, we're just going to start from the left and work our way right. So do I have an three SN2s? Do I have SN plus two on the right side? Because I've got it on the left, so I need to check and see if it's on the right. So SN plus two is on the left. It is not on the right. We do not cancel it up. Six electrons on the left, six electrons on the right. We cancel those out. 14 hydrogen on the left, no hydrogen on the right. We do not cancel it out. We have one Cr207 on the left, none on the right. So now we are left with that. So then we'll go back in and rewrite what we've got to have one clear redox reaction here. So 3Sn with a plus 2 charge plus 14 hydrogen ions plus Cr2O7 minus 2 produces 3Sn with a plus 4 charge plus 2Cr with a plus 3 charge plus 7H2O. And that would be our total redox reaction there, making sure everything is good. Now, you can go back in and double check this. On the left side, I have 3 times a positive 2 for my charge from 10. So I'm just going to up here in the top right corner. I've got a plus 6 from that plus 14 hydrogen ions, so plus 14. So we're looking at a total of 20 minus 2. We're going to get a total of 18. Now let's look on our right side. I've got 3 times positive 4. That's going to give me 12, so positive 12. Plus 2 times positive 3, so plus 6. That'll give me a total of 18. Do our charges add up? Yes, they do. Then you can go back in and double check and count and make sure that everything is the same in terms of numbers. On the left side, I've got 310. On the right side, I've got 310. On the left side, I have 14 hydrogens. On the right side, I have 7 times 2, so 14 hydrogens. On the left side, I have 2 chromium. On the right side, 2 chromium. On the left side, 7 oxygen. On the right side, 7 oxygen. So then this, now I've double checked it. This is our correct answer. All right. So I know that is a lot of work, but it is kind of straightforward as long as you follow your rules. Okay. So we're going to do one more with y'all, and then I'm going to leave the rest for y'all to do on your own. So here I've got MnO4 with a minus 2 plus I with a negative 1. It's going to produce MnO2 plus I2 in a basic solution. So again, remember that if they tell us that it's in a basic solution, we're going to have to go back in and add hydroxide to the side with hydrogen. Okay? Okay. So... Looking at this, I have Mn, O4, negative 2. First off, I need to write my skeleton half equations, half reactions. So I have Mn, O4 with a negative 2. It's going to produce MnO2. 
2. Done with that one. So that is half reaction A. Half reaction B, we've got I with a negative 1, and it's going to produce I2. Okay, done there. Half reactions are out of the way. So next step, go back in, balance all of our elements. Manganese, good on the left. Manganese, good on the right. Iodine, good on the left. Iodine, not good on the right. So we're going to have to go back in and put a 2 there in the front. Moving on, balance out our, our um, elements that are not oxygen or hydrogen. So now let's balance out our oxygen. On reaction A, I have four oxygen on the left and two on the right. So I'm going to have to add two water. On my iodine here, reaction B, there is no oxygen, so I don't need to worry about it. Next step, balance out our hydrogen. I need to add some hydrogen ions. On the right side, I have four hydrogen, right? So on the left side, I'm, need, I'm going to need to add four hydrogens. Okay, keep on moving along. Iodine here, we don't have any hydrogen, so we don't need to worry about that step. Next step, balance out our charge. So on reaction A, I have four hydrogen ions, which is a plus four, and a negative two ion from the MnO4. So I have a total of positive two on the left. On the right side, I do not have any, right? So there's no charge there. So over here on the left, I'm gonna have to add two electrons. Okay, it's gonna cancel everything out there. Now down here at the bottom, I have two negative on the left and I have zero on the right. So the more positive side is gonna be on the right. So I'm gonna add two electrons there. Okay, so now we've balanced out our charge. So the next thing is to make sure our electrons equal each other. On the reaction A, I have two. On reaction B, I also have two. So I don't need to do that step. Uh, next step, so reaction or step seven, we're going to add all of our half reactions together. So I have two electrons plus four hydrogen ions plus MnO4 minus two plus two iodine ions produces MnO2 plus 2H2O, plus I2, plus two electrons. Go back in, cancel out anything that's the same. So our electrons were the same. Now, next thing. So normally, this would be where we stop, rewrite the equation, we're done. However, remember that this is in a basic solution. Since it's in a basic solution, I need to go back in and add an equal amount of hydroxide ions to both sides to cancel out my hydrogen ions. Okay, so on the left side, I have four hydrogen ions, and on the right, there's none. So I'm going to need to come over here to the left side and add four hydroxide ions. But what I do to one, I must do to the other. Okay, now when we do that, what we're going to end up seeing is that I've got four hydroxides and four hydrogens. Well, what that means is that this all turns into water, right? Because four hydroxides and four hydrogens means water is made. Now, when I did that, I added water to the left. On the right, I already had some water. So we cancel out what we can. On the right side, I have two water. On the left side, I have four. So this four is going to turn into two. Okay, now I go back in, I look through this, everything else is canceled out. So all that's left is to rewrite. So two H2O plus MnO4 with a minus two plus two iodine produces MnO2 plus I2 plus 4OH minus. And that would be it for your redox reactions there. Okay. All right. So I'm actually going to leave 
these next three problems for practice for y'all to do. Um, I'm just going to actually write down your final answer on the key. If you end up needing help, please don't hesitate to reach out on that. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and move on to our final thing very, very quickly here. We're going to talk about oxidation and reduction in titrations. So looking at our uh, notes from acids and bases, one of the things that you should have, um, or when we talked about them, we talked about titrations. Now, remember, a titration is going to be when you're trying to determine the identity of an unknown substance. Well, the most common reagents that we use, the most common agents we will use for oxidation and reduction titrations are KMNO4 and K2Cr2O7. Now, MnO4 minus is going to be in an acidic solution. And so that's the reason we, we like to use it because a lot of times our indicators work really well with that MnO4. It turns purple when it is in that indicator. So when you titrate your MnO4, the solution is colorless until you use up all your reducing agent. So remember, that's going to be the uh, substance that is being oxidized. Now, in calculation, work redox reactions like acid-base titrations. So when we did that acid-base titration last um, in the previous lesson, um, that's going to be the same thing that you're doing with your redox titrations. You're looking at them, you're going to work them the same way. Now remember, you must have a balanced reaction anytime you're doing these titrations because that's going to be what gives you your multiple ratio. So here's my question. It says a 23.30 uh, milliliter sample of KMnO4 solution is decolorized by 0.1111 grams of oxalic acid, which is H2C2O4. The products are Mn2 and Mn2 and CO2 gas. Calculate the concentration of the KMnO4 using the following equation. So here's the equation they give you. So looking at this, what do I need to do? Well, I'm trying to find the concentration of KMnO4. So I need to solve for KMnO4. I'm looking for the concentration of KMnO4. So the first thing I need to do is actually get into KMnO4, right? Find the number of moles of KMnO4. So how do I do that? Well, what I know is that I have 0.1111 grams of oxalic acid, H2C2O4. And I know that grams of oxalic acid is not what I'm looking for, so I drop it low. C2O4. And I find on my periodic table that my molar mass is 90.03 grams for every one mole of oxalic acid. H2C2O4. But again, my question is not asking for moles of H2C2, uh, not asking for moles of oxalic acid. I'm going to drop this low again, cancel that out, H2C2O4, and I'm going to go into moles of MnO4. Why did I choose MnO4? Well, because I know that the ratio between MnO4 and KMnO4 is a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So we're going to get to that. We're going to say that there are five moles of the H2C2O4 for every two moles of that KMnO4, or sorry, of that MnO4. Then we're going to keep on going because this isn't quite what we're looking for. So moles of MnO4 with a negative charge into moles of KMnO4. All right, and that would be a one-to-one -one ratio. So we're gonna take that and we're gonna plug that into our calculator. And what we find is that we're gonna have 4.936 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of KMnO4. But again, my question is not asking me for moles, it's asking for concentration. So we'll take this and we will divide it by our sample size, which was 0 0.02333 liters. Moles divided by liters. Take that, plug it into our calculator, and we find that we have 0 0.02130 
molarity of KMNO4. All right, y'all, that is it. I know this was a long set of lessons, um, but you are finished for the day. All right, let us know if y'all anything, y'all need anything. Otherwise, y'all have a great rest of the day. Bye, y'all.